Hi, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Stories of the Supernatural. Wherever you find us, whether it's a video or podcast on your favorite platform, please like and subscribe to us so that you can get notification of when a new show is released. You can also find us on major social media platforms. If you go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com, you can find links to the videos or MP3 files, which you can download and enjoy without commercial interruptions. If you're into classic horror, ghost, and adventure stories, I narrate Nightshade Diary, and you can find links at NightshadeDiary.com. If scary stories are your bag, and listening to encounters with cryptids, ghosts, dogmen, and other weird creatures sends a shiver up your spine, then go to SupernaturalStoryTime.com for links to our weekly podcasts. Noteworthy news about the paranormal world, true crime, conspiracy stories, and anything that is just plain weird can be found at eerie.news or visit the Stranger Than Fiction Stories tab at MiamiGhostChronicles.com. Please subscribe to my newsletter on Substack. Just go to mppelliser.com for a link. I want to thank you for being part of my audience, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good, I hope. Well, today by popular demand... I am going to go ahead and put together um, a compilation of certain movies, whether you want to call them the movies, the movie set, the actors, the subject matter, most likely, uh, which have been considered either cursed, jinxed, whatever the case might be. All right. And sometimes some of these things are happening while the film is being uh, produced. But other times it's almost like in retrospect that people looking back say, wow, that was really odd how many people or, you know, bad, uh, you know, had bad things happen to them, including dying or things happen on the set. In other words, it takes a few years for somebody to look back and say, wait a minute, the odds here are a little bit stacked uh, against this happening to so many people at the same time. Now, the uh, the first one that I'm going to go into, this is a film I had never heard about. And in a way, it was kind of an obscure film. And it came out in 1966. All right, which, by the way, uh, this is around the time that a lot of the the films started to get like kind of really, really dark. Uh, and I mean, as far as you know, up to then during the '60s, every everybody remembers all the Hammer films with Christopher Lee and the Dracula and all this, and Peter Cushing and the Bloodshot Eyes. But then all of a sudden, you I, you start seeing a lot of the subject matter in a lot of, especially as a matter of fact, it overlapped with um, with even the Dracula movies where they start to overlap into Satanism, devil worship, etc., etc. Now, the, uh, the, like I said, the first film is called Incubus, all right? And uh, basically what's referred to it is The Curse of the Black Goat. Incubus was a 1966 American horror film starring soon-to-be Captain Kirk William Shatner. However, its claim to fame has more to do with a streak of misfortune that struck many that were involved in the film. It was directed by Leslie Stevens, who created The Outer Limits and shot in black and white. The actors spoke their lines in the constructed language Esperanto to create an otherworldly feeling. The plot surrounds the efforts of succubus and incubus to lead human souls into perdition. Even in the 1960s, it was considered an underground film, and perhaps many were unaware of the curse that would nip at the heels of those involved in its production. The setting is a small village named Nomentum during a lunar eclipse. There are two succubus sisters, Kia, played by Allison Ames, and Amael, played by Eloise Hart. Kia determines to seduce an innocent or clean soul. The intended victim is William Shatner's character, a wounded soldier. At the end of the film, the question is, does purity overcome corruption? The incubus was played by Yugoslavian Milos Milos, born Milos Milosovic, who was a stunt double and bodyguard for actor Alain Delon. He was the first to suffer the consequences of working in the film. In 1965, while still married to Cynthia Buron, Milo started an affair with actress Carolyn Mitchell, born Barbara Ann Thomason, who was estranged from her husband, actor Mickey Rooney. Shortly after the release of Incubus, in February of 1966, Barbara Thomason Rooney, 29, and Milo's 25, were found dead in the bathroom of the home she once shared with Mickey Rooney and their four children. The police believed it was a murder-suicide spurred by Milo's belief that Barbara was seeking to reconcile with Mickey. During the incident, Rooney was at St. John's Hospital in Santa Monica, 
recovering from an intestinal infection he caught in the Philippines while filming Ambush Bay. The story was that Rooney had returned from the Philippines in December to find that his estranged wife had taken up with Milos, who had been a friend of the family for a year. A week before the incident, Rooney had filed for divorce. The day of the murder, Mickey and Barbara met at the hospital and Rooney tried to convince her to resume their marriage, and she agreed to stop seeing Milos. They had married in 1960. Milos' wife Cynthia had already filed for divorce, charging him with assault. Initially, Milosovic agreed to end the relationship. He then took Barbara into the master bedroom and locked the door. This was the last time either was seen alive. The next day, a house guest unlocked the bedroom door and found Barbara Rooney shot through the jaw. Milo's body was on top of hers. He had a bullet hole through his temple. Afterwards, official inquiry found that Milo's had shot Thompson with Rooney's chrome-plated 38 caliber revolver. Rumors swirled that Rooney was the one who killed them both in revenge for the betrayal. This was Rooney's fifth marriage. In a strange twist, it appeared that being Alain Delon's bodyguard came with its own run of bad luck. Stevan Markovic, who was Delon's bodyguard, was found murdered in a Paris rubbish dump in 1969. The police investigation disclosed allegations of sex parties involving Delon and other French government officials. In 1969, the BBC interviewed Delon about what became known as the Markovic Affair. The reporter asked him, People once more don't say it straight to your face, but they suggest very, very strong that you have homosexual tastes. Delon answered, so what's wrong if I had? Or I did. Would I be guilty of something? If I like it, I'll do it. We have a great actor in France named Michel Simon, and Michel Simon said once, If you like your goat, make love with your goat. But the only matter is to love. Ironically, Alain Delon was considered a screen sex symbol during the 1960s and 1970s, and there's that strange tie into a goat which figures prominently in the film of Incubus. Now, getting back to the Incubus curse. Shortly after the release of the film, Leslie Stevens' production company went bankrupt. He was married to Allison Ames, and they divorced. Shatner's sister in the film, who is raped by a goat, which is the Incubus in disguise, is played by actress Alan Atmar. She committed suicide in October of 1966. Then in 1968, Marina Habe, 17, the daughter of another actress in the film, Eloise Hart, was viciously murdered. Her body was found dumped off Mulholland Drive. The killers were never found. Some believe she was the victim of members of the Manson family. A year later, Sharon Tate and her unborn child would be murdered by the Manson family. She had attended the premiere of Incubus with her husband, Roman Polanski. The film, thought to be lost, was found in France in 1996 with French subtitles at Cinématique Française. Some were spared from the dark shadow cast by Incubus. Shatner would go on to become one of Hollywood's most recognizable characters. Cinematographer Conrad Hall would go on to win three Academy Awards for his work on Butch Cassidy and The Sundance Kid, American Beauty, and Road to Perdition. In his book, Shatner Rules, Shatner described that a few months after the end of filming, he was in a makeup chair for Star Trek when a rock came crashing through the trailer window. He found a note attached to it, which read, Your next Shatner, the Esperantist. I said they were angry because they had not been consulted during the course of the film and ticked off they were excluded from the premiere. They had also asked for autographs from Shatner and the request had been ignored. So they decided to curse Incubus and anyone who laid eyes on the film. Shatner writes that he destroyed every copy of the movie he came across. Something like that movie The Ring? Dun, dun, dun. All right. Then we go on to, of course, everyone knows about The Exorcist. And um, there was things going on during the filming. Uh, when do disturbing coincidences fail to explain a pattern that bring only one word to mind, a curse? What if you're working on the set of what turns out to be one of the most chilling movie produced that had the devil as the main villain? These are just some of the so-called accidents that almost 50 years in retrospect plagued the film set The Exorcist. In 1973, The Exorcist was released. Linda Blair was cast as 12-year-old Regan, and she recalls a series of unsettling incidents that occurred on the set to actors or behind-the-scene personnel. Halfway through the film, a fire destroyed much of the set, except the part of Linda Blair's bedroom, where the major portion of Regan's possession was filmed. Linda Blair was later to learn that certain disturbing incidents were kept from her in order that she should not be frightened. Ellen Burstein, who herself suffered an accident during the film, claimed that there were several other people involved in the film that died. People eventually... 
People die eventually, but what are the odds that so many had ties to a particular film in one way or another? Jack McGowan played Burke Dennings, the alcoholic director. One week after completing his work on the film, he died from a heart attack that started out as a case of the flu. Vasiliki Maliros, who played Father Damien's mother, died from natural cause at the age of 89 when the film was still in post-production. During filming, Max von Sydow, brother and Linda Blair's grandfather, died. Jason Miller, who played Father Karras, was stunned to find out that his son Jordan was hit by a motorcyclist who appeared out of nowhere on an empty beach. It wasn't just actors or extras, but anyone who had some contact with the production. In New York, one of the carpenters accidentally cut off his thumb, and one of the lighting technicians lost a toe while working on the set. The man who refrigerated the studio, keeping it abnormally cold during the shooting, died. The assistant cameraman's wife had a baby that died. The janitor who took care of the building was shot and killed. Friedkin asked two priests who were hired as technical advisors, one who was hired as a technical advisor, to bless the set. This stopped all the sinister experiences, but around the time, a fire broke out in the Jesuit residence in Georgetown. Mercedes McCambridge was the voice of the demon. In November 1987, her son John Markle shot his wife and two daughters after being accused of fraud. According to the Chicago Tribune, he then went on to a study, shot himself in the temple. Next to his body, authorities found a white rubber old man mask. Nightmare on Elm Street was in the VCR and later was discovered he had used three different guns for the slaying. The Little Rock Police Department would discover that Markle had been fired the previous Friday, which was Friday the 13th, for a sophisticated embezzlement scheme that benefited Markle's mother, Academy Award-winning actress Mercedes McCambridge. In his suicide note, he blamed his mother for his decision in killing his family and himself. He cited her two suicide attempts, drinking and failed marriages, and mostly her lack of love for him. The letter contained the following, quote, Initially you said, well, we can work it out, but no, you refused. You called me a liar, a cheat, a criminal, a bum. You said I ruined your life. You were never around much when I needed you. So now I and my whole family are dead, so you can have the money. What better place for a serial killer than a film about the devil? Paul Bateson was an x-ray tech at NYU Medical Center who played an extra in the film as what else? An x-ray technician. Starting in 1975, this is two years after The Exorcist completed, by the way, several bodies of unidentified gay men had been found dismembered, placed in bags, and tossed into the Hudson River. The only clue police had was their clothing came from a shop in Greenwich Village that catered to the leather subculture. In September 1977, Addison Verrill, a reporter, was found murdered in his apartment. The police had no suspects. Village Voice journalist Arthur Bell wrote a piece about the crime and he received a call from a man who said he'd met, quote, Viril at Badlands, a gay bar in Christopher Street, where they partied until 3 a.m. After that, they stopped at a gay BDSM club called Mineshaft before heading to a real studio apartment. A few days later, Bell received a call from another mystery man who told them Viril's murderer was Bateson. Bateson was part of the S&M and leather subculture of Greenwich Village. He was an alcoholic drinking at least a quart of vodka a day, which made it difficult to hold down a job. He was fired from the hospital where he worked at when he was hired to work on the film. On March 5, 1979, Paul Bateson was found guilty of murdering Addison Burrill, who he stabbed and bludgeoned with an iron skillet. The prosecution attempted to connect Bateson to what was then known as the bag murders, but were unable to do so, even though he did brag about committing them while serving his prison term. He said he'd done it for fun. Unable to prosecute him for the crimes, detectives were convinced of his guilt. These events inspired the movie Cruising, which technically remains unsolved. He was sentenced to a term of 20 years to life in prison to be served at Rikers Island. He was released in 2004. He is now said to live somewhere in upstate New York. Coincidentally or not, these crimes were committed after he worked on the Exorcist film. William Peeler Blatty, who wrote the novel, The Exorcist, based it on a true story of a 14-year-old boy from St. Louis, who underwent an exorcism in 1949. The identity of the boy was recently confirmed. He was Ronald Edwin Hunkler, who passed away in 2020. He worked 40 years for NASA as an engineer. And this is Ronald Hunkler's story. And he was part of the exorcist film, even if it was behind the scene, 
you know, because basically it was a newspaper article written about his exorcism that was what inspired Blatty to go on and write the book and so on and so forth. And he's got an interesting story on his own. Now, what are the odds that a boy exercised by Jesuits in 1949 would grow up to work for NASA? Many people keep secrets, especially from childhood. But Ronald Edwin Hunkler's was unique. He was the boy that inspired the novel The Exorcist, written by William Peter Blatty and released as a film in 1973. In order to protect his identity, the teenage boy was referred to as Robbie Mannheim, or Roland Doe, by the Jesuit priest who exorcised him. A handful of lay people knew the real name of the boy who endured a series of exorcism in 1949. In 1973, the exorcist movie filled up Catholic churches and confessionals with parishioners who had not set foot inside one for years, all but driven by the fear their soul would be stolen by Satan. However, by the time the film was released, Ronald Edwin Hunkler worked as an engineer at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. He patented technology to help protect the space shuttle from extreme heat. In 2001, he retired after 40 years at the agency, guarding the secret of his experience as a teenager. He died on May 10, 2020, just three weeks shy of his 86th birthday. The following is an excerpt from the 1949 article that inspired William Peter Blatty to write The Exorcist. Blatty was 20 years old and an English major at Georgetown University. And this was this uh, article was uh, written by Bill Brinkley at the Washington Post, and it was titled "Priest Frees Mount Rainier Boy Reported Held in Devil's Grip." In what is perhaps one of the most remarkable experiences of its kind in recent religious history, a 14-year-old Mount Rainier boy has been freed by a Catholic priest of possession by the devil. Catholic sources reported yesterday, only after between 20 and 30 performances of the ancient ritual of exorcism. Here and in St. Louis was a devil finally cast out of the boy, it was said. In all except the last of these, the boy broke into a violent tantrum of screaming, cursing, and voicing of Latin phrases, a language he had never studied, whenever the priest reached the climatic point of the ritual, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, that cast thee the devil out. In complete devotion to his task, the priest stayed with the boy over a period of two months, during which he said he personally witnessed such manifestations as the bed in which the boy was sleeping suddenly moving across the room. A Washington Protestant minister had previously reported personally witnessing similar manifestations, including one in which the pallet on which the sleeping boy lay slid slowly across the floor until the boy, boy's head bumped against the bed awakening him. The boy was taken to Georgetown University Hospital where his affliction was exhaustively studied and to St. Louis University, both are Jesuit institutions. The ritual was undertaken by a St. Louis priest, a Jesuit in his 50s, who devoted himself to the task through prayers and fasting. The ritual began in St. Louis, continued here, and finally ended in St. Louis. For two months, the priest stayed with a boy, accompanying him back and forth on the train, sleeping in the same house and sometimes in the same room with him. Repeatedly, each time the ritual was performed, the final violent reaction would come from the boy when the words were spoken, I cast thee out. A reaction of profanity and screaming and the astounding use of Latin phrases, the priest was reported as saying. In one manifestation, the boy reported that he had seen a vision of St. Michael casting out the devil. All right, and for those of you watching the video, that right there with the X, that's Hunkler, okay, in a photograph. Seems very normal, doesn't he? Hunkler was born June 1, 1935, to a Lutheran mother and a non-practicing Catholic father. His father was 35 years old and his mother 32. Their names were Edwin Hunkler and Odell Capage. By the way, when I say his father was 35 and 32, that's how old they were when he was born. He was an only child. There's no mention of any other child. And and, and the reason why I f I'm going to mention later on why that comes into play, that the only child of maybe not old parents, but older parents, why maybe they put up with a lot of stuff. Now, he lived with his parents and a paternal German-speaking grandmother at a house located at 41 Central Avenue, Cottage City, Maryland. The address was changed to 3807 40th Avenue in the early 1940s. The Hunklers lived there from 1949 to 1958. On January 26, 1949, Matilda Hendricks, knee Hunkler, 54, referred to as Aunt Tilly, 
died of multiple sclerosis. She was deeply immersed in spiritualism and used a Ouija board with her nephew. Mrs. Hunkler thought her sister-in-law's spirit was behind the manifestations. Mar- Mark Op- Opsasnik, who wrote the book The Real Story Behind the Exorcist, interviewed one of Ronald Hunkler's neighborhood friends, who discussed the matter only if his name was withheld. He was referred to as J.C. He stated, No, I don't think he was ever possessed. I think it was psychological. As far as any real possession or anything like that, I don't think so. There's some interesting psychological aspects to it. There were German Lutherans, and he was an only child, and I think the grandmother is actually the central figure. She played a very influential role in all of this. You had this old world religion superstition, and the mother got caught up in it, and the father just kind of stayed in the background. I think he could see what was going on, which is why he is never mentioned. The true story is much more intriguing from a psychological point of view. The basis of the real thing could be a damn good story, no doubt about it in my mind. The rest of it, I can run a parallel. You had these two mischief makers that had a strong tendency to take advantage of people who were weaker than themselves. They were a pair of connivers, and they had their act down. In pairs like that, they compete with each other, and they don't get along well, and they have to keep doing something to retain their relationship, and all the time, this is mischief in one form or another. They were trying to outdo each other. Which leads me to believe that who they're talking about is the grandmother and her grandson. Obsasnik also interviewed B.C., J.C.'s brother, who was Hunkler's best friend for many years. He described Ronald as living with a fanatically religious mother and a grandmother who believed in spiritualism. Ronald was disliked by his classmates and was known to throw tantrums. He displayed violent tendencies and exhibited sadistic behavior towards animal and people. These were personality traits that predated his so-called possession. B.C. said, quote, People ask what he was like back then, and I can tell you that he was never what you would call a normal child. He was an only child and kind of spoiled, and he was a mean bastard. We were together all the time, and we used to fight all the time. According to Dr. Alvin Kagi, who attended school with Hunkler, he described him as withdrawn, unpopular, and not very athletic. J.C. described Hunkler's last day at school in 1949. We were in a class together at Bladensburg Junior High. He was sitting in a chair, and it was one of those deals with one arm attached, and it looked like he was shaking the desk. The desk was shaking and vibrating extremely fast, and I remember the teacher yelling at him to stop it, and I remember he kind of yelled, I'm not doing it, and they took him out of the class, and that was the last I ever saw of him in school. The desk certainly did not move around the room like that book possessed said. It was just shaking. I don't know if he was doing it or what was going, or what was doing it because I just can't clear it in my mind. He went on to describe his own interaction with Hunkler. There was this dog that ran around the neighborhood at that time. It was a half-red Cocker Spaniel, and it looked like it was half chow. This dog was mean, and nobody ever knew who owned it. It just came out of nowhere. Well, Ron basically adopted the dog. That dog was really his best friend, not me. The dog hated everyone, and everything would bite anyone in sight, but he loved Ron. Ron would feed it and bring it in the house with him. One time he called me up and told me to come over and I never really trusted him because he was sneaky and a real mean little bastard. I was going over there and he was looking out from the basement window and when I got to his house I heard the back porch door slam and I knew right away what he'd done. He'd done this sort of thing many times before to different kids. I started running like hell because he'd sick that dog on me. When I got home he called me up and was laughing like hell. That's what kind of person he was. He did that all the time. Father Edwin Hughes, who passed away in 1980, was an assistant pastor at St. James Church in Mount Rainier, Maryland, in 1949. It's believed Mrs. Hunkler took her son in February to see him. It's claimed that after an initial session, Father Hughes sent the boy to Georgetown University Hospital, where three days of exorcisms were performed. There's controversy as to whether it's true that Hughes was injured during one of the exorcisms. Ronald Edwin Hunkler was admitted to Georgetown University Hospital under his real name on the morning of Monday, February 28, 1949, and released at 12 noon on Thursday, March 3, 1949. By then, Reverend Luther Schultz, a Protestant minister, had been sought out by the family. However, when things grew worse, he referred them to the Jesuit priest in St. Louis. Doctors had already been consulted regarding Ronald's condition, but it seems they could offer no explanation or remedy either. According to Frank Bober, 
Father Hugh's assistant pastor. It was Mrs. Hunkler who sought out the clergy for help. He said, Father Hughes never went to the boy's home. Basically, it was the mother that brought the kid to the rectory, and the thing is, she's the only one who gave Father Hughes all the information. Everything that I know of that he shared with me took place in the rectory, not at the house. Father Hughes told them that the Hunkler boy had a dark stare, almost as if there was nothing behind the eyes. Bober said that Hughes felt an unseen force pressing him against the wall. Father William Bowdern was brought in to perform more than 20 exorcisms on Roland over a period of two months. He was assisted by Father Hughes, Father Walter Halloran, and Father Raymond Bishop. Bishop kept a diary that Blatty would use when writing his novel, and that would be reprinted in Thomas Allen's book, Possessed. The following is Father Bishop's diary entry for Easter Sunday, April 17th, or refers to Ronald Hunkler. Father Widman, hospital chaplain, made three unsuccessful attempts to give R. Holy Communion in his room. After some waiting and slapping of R., the fourth attempt succeeded. Brother Theophane, who was on nurse duty in R.'s room, was reading the office of the Blessed Virgin. It was about 6.45 a.m. when he came to the Regina Kelly. R. jumped out of bed, then grabbed the office book from the brother and reached for the scapular from the brother's habit, which was placed on a nearby chair. R. fought and spit at the brother and trampled the scapular underfoot in an Indian war dance. The devil said, I will not let him go to Mass. Everyone thinks it will be good for him. It was impossible to get R., to the chapel because of his frequent seizures. Father Bowden was called to the hospital and shortly after his arrival the spell was broken. There was no further reaction until evening. In the evening R was spending a little time with the brothers at blank outside the hospital. Brother Emmett was escorting R back to the basement floor of the hospital when R went into a fighting spell. The brother was alone and shouted for help but it was some time before the other brothers heard. Brother Emmett was quite exhausted from the struggle, R was carried into the elevator and placed in his fifth room floor. The fathers immediately began the prayers of exorcism, and the usual indications of violence continued. The blank showed his power again by saying that he would have R awaken and ask for a knife. He had threatened to kill those who molested him while he was in a seizure. When R came out of the spell, he asked for a knife so that he might cut an Easter egg. A little later, the devil said they would have R awaken and ask for a drink of water, and R carried out the plan. There was no response to the Principio except taunting remarks to the exorcist. Everyone, including R, was becoming weary of the long performance. R did not begin to sleep until midnight. The fathers left the hospital at 12.45 p.m. In 1949, Brother Rector Cornelius sealed the fifth floor corridor which hosted the exorcism after having the statue of St. Michael removed. The room and the existence of a copy of the diary along with a note from the Cornelius date April 29, 1949, remained locked away until the demolition of the old wing in the hospital. In October 1978, workmen clearing out furniture stored in the old wing of the Alexiam Brothers Hospital that hosted the exorcism in St. Louis allegedly discovered the official record of the events, which confirmed that Father Bowden and Halloran had performed the exorcism over four nights in 1949. Father Walter Halloran was willing to discuss what happened in 1949. He said, I can't go on record. I never made an absolute statement about the things because I didn't feel I was qualified. I hadn't studied the phenomena and that sort of thing. All I did was report the things that I saw and whether I would make a statement one way or another wouldn't make any difference. As to whether Hunkler spoke in other languages, he said, quote, just Latin. I think he mimicked us. He went on to clarify there were no demonic changes in the boy's voice and that when Hunkler struck him, it was with normal strength. However, unexplained events did occur, he said. I saw a bottle slide from a dresser across the room. There was no one near it. The bed moving. It was on rollers like any bed, but I was leaning on it when it moved one time. But contrary to the movie, Hunkler did not vomit or urinate, and there was no markings on his skin. The Alexiam Brothers Hospital, where Ronald was taken to, served as an insane asylum as well. It received its first patient in 1870. In 1909, it became affiliated with St. Louis University, and it admitted only male patients. However, men, women, and children were seen on an outpatient basis. They operated a training school for male nurses from 1928 until 1952. In 1902, a priest who was taking treatment at the hospital hung himself on the premises. Hunkler's female version, Hunkler's female companion told newspapers that he died after suffering a stroke at his home in Marriottsville, Maryland. He was cremated, but none of his children attended his funeral. 
His two daughters and a son had been estranged from him for a long time. She said that he never believed that he had been possessed and shunned religion as an adult. He lived in fear that his identity would be discovered. And she said he had a terrible life from worry, worry, worry. They would leave the house on Halloween in case someone had discovered he was the haunted boy and its anonymity would be over. She said, he said he wasn't possessed. It was all concocted. He said, I was just a bad boy. However, there was an unusual event that occurred not long before Hunkler died. A Catholic priest came to him to administer last rites. His companion had not contacted any church. I have no idea how the father knew to come, she said, but he got Ron to heaven. Ron's in heaven and he's with God now. And you know what? That's very interesting because was he, did he have a behavior disorder? Was the devil in control of him? Because again, and this is something, as you can see, where they took him for his exorcism, the Alexian Hospital already dealt with um, the mentally ill. So you would think that they would be very uh, well versed in recognizing somebody that had a mental problem. But they still went ahead and exercised him. I don't know. Was he, you know, and, and apparently they, they had to do this for quite a lot of days. So you, you ask yourself, was Ronald really possessed? Was Ronald just a BS artist? He was extremely intelligent. He went on to become a NASA engineer and developed a product to shield the, the shuttle from re-entry heat and or was he possessed and he just learned how to keep low level because according to what his quasi friend said from his childhood he was not a nice kid at all okay then we go on to another film that came out like maybe a couple of years after the the exorcist because of course hollywood saw how much money everybody made so they jumped on the bandwagon and on June 6, 1976, the movie The Omen was released. Just a few years before, the movies The Exorcist and Rosemary's Baby had made moviegoers believe in the devil again. It became an instant success, but the audiences were unaware that from the beginning, those who participated in the movie seemed to be cursed by weird accidents and even untimely deaths. Hot on the heels of blockbusters with the father of lies as the main villain, it was inevitable that one would be made featuring the Antichrist. However, Robert Munger was the one who thought of making him a little child. Harvey Bernhardt and Mace Neufeld producers were not put off by making a film with satanic overtones and saw dollar signs instead of the portents that were quick to materialize from the very beginning of the production. Munger, a devout Christian, did offer Bernhardt a warning that the devil would not take kindly to being exposed. The producers did not feel unlucky when they landed Gregory Peck to play the lead role of the movie. But a short time after he agreed to the role, Peck's 30-year-old son, Jonathan, committed suicide. Peck was heartbroken, but he decided to continue to work in the film. However, as he flew to England in October 1975, the plane he was traveling in was struck by lightning, and one of the motors caught fire, almost taking him to a watery grave. A few days later, either Newfeld or David Seltzer, the screenwriter, there's a conflict as to who it was trekked across the Atlantic as well. And despite the odds being against it, his plane was also struck by lightning. After that, producer Harvey Bernhardt narrowly escaped being struck by lightning while filming in Rome. One has to wonder if it's just about then some eyebrows were being raised among the production crew and the actors. But apparently the third time was not the charm. Bernhardt was taking no chances and started to carry a cross with him while on the set. Part of the film was to include an aerial shot of London, and at the last minute an airplane reserved for use by Richard Donner, the Omen's director, and a film crew was given instead to a Chinese businessman. The plane crashed at the end of the runway after being struck by birds, and it went through a perimeter fence, hitting a vehicle that contained a driver and five children. All the persons in the car were killed. The scenes of the Rottweilers who afterwards became known as Devil Dogs, was the next instance of devilish interference, when a heavily padded stuntman was badly bitten by dogs that refused to obey their trainer and actually continued to attack despite being called off. The next scenes of the movie were shot in a safari park, and Lee Remick, who played Damien's mother, and the actor, child actor Harvey Stevens were genuinely terrified by the vicious reaction of the baboons. Sidney Bamford, an animal handler who was present to oversee the animals, 
was killed the following day by a tiger who was not properly caged and grabbed him by the top of his head and mauled him to death. The next scenes of the movie were shot in a safari park, and Lee Remick, who played Damien's mother, and the child actor Harvey Stevens, who, again, they go, the next, you know, the next uh, scene you're going to see is, by then it, it, you're, you're realizing that Lee Remick is starting to get worried about what she's seeing going on around her. Um, Newfeld was staying at the Hilton Hotel in London during the filming, and again, Satan Timons need to be off when he escaped death after the IRA blew the building up. Like a persistent, if inaccurate, hitman, a few days later, Newfeld was to meet Gregory Peck and other film executives at a well known London restaurant when he missed the bombing there by only a few minutes. By this time, the actors were thoroughly spooked, and Lee Remick refused to shoot a scene where she fell from a balcony. She was convinced something would go horrifically wrong. That was when the scene was changed to her falling over the railing to the towels below, while her son, who caused the accident, looks down dispassionately at his dying mother. In typical Hollywood style, the film was released on June 6, 1976, playing on the 666 motif, but at the end of the film, it didn't, did not seem to end the ripple effect from having worked on it. Two months later, on Friday, August 13, 1976, John Richardson, who engineered the special effects of the film, including the decapitation by the sheet of glass by the character played by Richard Warner, was en route to Omen in the Netherlands. Yes, there's a place in the Netherlands spelled O-M-M-E-N. He was working on Richard Attenborough's A Bridge Too Far. Liz Moore, who was a sculptress who had worked on special effects for the Omen, and had made the first C-3PO prototype in 1975, was a passenger in the vehicle when it had a head-on collision. Richardson was seriously injured, but Lismore was decapitated when a tire went flying through the window. Richardson later claimed he saw a sign on the side of the road saying the town of Omen was 66.6 kilometers away. Alf Joint, an experienced stuntman who had worked on the Omen movie, also went on to work on a bridge too far. In a sequence where he was to jump from a roof and onto an airbag, he strangely fell and missed the airbag, almost killing him. When he awoke in the hospital, he claimed something had pushed him, even though no one had been near him when the incident occurred. Coincidence or curse either way didn't stop two Omen sequels to be made. That's a lot of people. Okay, even when you're, the actors themselves are thinking, oh boy. So, this next... This is, this is, um, it's called Riding the Blue Buick, and it's about actress Jane Mansfield. Now, on a hot summer night, a blue vehicle glided along a narrow road known as the Old Spanish Trail. In a space of a few seconds, the quiet was rent as the screech of twisting metal reverberated, and three of six passengers in the automobile met a violent death. One of them was named Jane Mansfield. Jane Mansfield was born April 19, 1933, her real name, or her birth name, was Vera Jane Palmer. Her parents lived in Phillipsburg, New Jersey. Her father, Herbert, an attorney, died when she was three years old. Her mother, Vera, married Harry L. Pierce, and the family moved to Dallas, Texas. She married Paul Mansfield on May 6, 1950, when she was 17. On November 8, she gave birth to their daughter, Jane Marie. The couple moved to Camp Gordon, Georgia, while he trained in the Army Reserve. And for those of you who want to count on a finger, yes, she got married in May and had a baby in November, which means she was pregnant. This was the same year that Vera Mansfield, her name then, received an offer for a role in the B-movie Prehistoric Women. In 1951, she went to Austin, Texas, and worked as a nude model for art classes and other jobs to earn a living. Jane separated from Paul in January 1955, the same year she modeled for Playboy. In 1976, her daughter, Jane Marie, was also featured in the magazine. It was at this point that she caught the media's attention and broke into the film industry and Broadway. Her similarity in looks and style to Marilyn Monroe, who died in 1962, could not be denied. In November 1957, Jane bought a Spanish-style mansion at 10100 Sunset Boulevard in Holmby Hills. Her next-door neighbor was Tony Curtis, who lived at Alwood Estate. The bulk of the money to buy came from an inheritance she received from her maternal grandfather, Elmer Palmer. The house dated back to 1929 when it was built as a honeymoon home for Rudy Valley, which he never occupied. He put it up for sale in 1936. In 1940, 
it was purchased by the Cantor family. Mr. Cantor was the head of the McDaniel grocery chain. In February 1958, an auction was held to sell the furnishings of the mansion where the family lived for 17 years. The following month, Jane bought the house, and it was after buying her dream home, which at one time was featured in Life magazine, that things seemed to go sideways for Jane Mansfield. That year, she bought the house. Jane divorced Paul Mansfield after testifying that, quote, he wanted to turn her into a kitchen slave. She then married Mr. Universe from 1955, Miklos Mickey Hardigay. Hargitay. When Jane Mansfield moved in with Mickey Hargitay, the house was done over in pink from end to end, thus earning its name as the Pink Palace. There was a heart-shaped tub and a heart-shaped swimming pool with two-foot mosaic message, I love you, Janie, inscribed at the bottom. Fans who toured by the estate would often be surprised when she would come out on the balcony and wave to them. She also drove a pink Jaguar to go with the theme of the house. Soon incidents started to occur which presaged the ultimate tragedy that was visited upon Jane Mansfield in June of 1967. October 1958, Mickey Hardigay and a then-pregnant Jane had a minor accident with an MTA bus that collided with their convertible. The damage was only to the bumper and estimated to be only $25 to repair. May of 1959, Mickey Hardigay made the papers again, probably due to being Jane Mansfield's husband. The story reported that he was ordered to pay $300 per month to support his daughter, Tina, nine, born to his first wife, Mary. It also noted that a white Cadillac convertible owned by Hardigay was recovered in Firestone Park several hours after it was reported stolen. Three occupants of the car were arrested, but one of them claimed a cousin whose name he couldn't remember obtained permission from Hargitay to use the automobile. So somebody's taking Mickey's white automobile and going for joy rides. The white caddy seemed to have a certain allure, because in August of 1959, this is only, what, three months from the last time, Baldwin McClinton, Jane's butler, was arrested for drunk driving while riding around in the car. The other person in the car, Charles Richardson, 25, was arrested on outstanding traffic warrants and driving without a license. Jane and Mickey were out of town. In October of 1960, the IRS placed a tax lien on the property for unpaid taxes from 1957. August of 1961, Pearlman Baldwin, probably the Baldwin McClinton, arrested in 1959, 41 and Hattie Green, 51, butler and maid for Jane Mansfield, suffered serious head injuries when they were struck head-on by a car driven by Elva Puckett, 65, whose car, whose car spun in a circle on the San Bernardino freeway when the brakes locked. Mrs. Puckett died and her husband, William, was seriously injured. May of 1962, Jane called a press conference where 40 newsmen and photographers showed up at the Pink Palace, where she told them she was calling off a divorce suit against Mickey Hardigay. Apparently, they had quarreled over her coming trip to Rome to film the movie Panic Button. However, it was a short-lived reconciliation when in August she signed a separation agreement. By Christmas, they were back together. Strangely enough, in the intervening months, she'd announced she was going to marry Enrico Bamba, an Italian film producer. She told reporters, Then all of a sudden it occurred to me that I wanted to reconcile with Mickey. The truth was that once she found out Enrico faced a long and expensive legal battle to obtain a divorce, Mickey seemed a safer bet. March 1963, Mickey Hardigay faced a $40,000 battery suit from Jane's hairstylist. He claimed that on February 21, Mickey pulled him out of Miss Mansfield's auto and maliciously and wrongfully assaulted him. The car was parked in front of the stylist's apartment. Jane was supposedly dropping him off after they had gone out for dinner. Mickey denied the incident. Two months later, the couple divorced in Chihuahua, Mexico. She was pregnant with their third child. By August of 1964, Jane filed an injunction against Mickey. She wanted to restrain him from, quote, annoying and molesting her and their daughter and from entering their home to remove personal property. Jane had given birth to them to their third child, Mariska. Their two boys, Miklos and Sultan, stayed living with Jane. The following year, she tied the knot with Matt Simber, real name Thomas Vitale Ottaviano, and they had one child, Tony. In February 1965, the Pink Palace was attached by the Sheriff's Department. Jane and Matt Simber were sued for $382,000 along with General Artist Corps. The suit involved a breach of contract. The complaint stated that Jane had agreed to star in a movie being filmed in Turkey. The project had been scheduled for June of 1964 and she never showed. The Pink Palace, for some reason, denied Jane marital bliss. By September of 1966, 
Her relationship with Simber had soured, and a judge ordered him to return their 11-month-old son to her. Her alcoholism and infidelities ended the relationship, and she claimed extreme cruelty in her divorce suit against him. She then started to live with her divorce attorney, Sam Brody. He was associated with attorney Melvin Belly during the Jack Ruby murder trial in Texas. There were rumors it was an abusive relationship. During this time, Jane crossed paths with Anton Zanzor LeVay, born Howard Stanton LeVay, a high school dropout, who joined the circus when he was 16. More of a, more of a provocateur than an actual Satanist, he denied all religions. He did, however, perform occult ceremonies to exalt his hedonistic belief system and get media attention. He established the Church of Satan. Sammy Davis Jr. attended an orgy party and eventually he was given the title of Warlock II. Anton gained international attention during this time. Anton was smitten with Jane and invited her to be his high priestess. Whispers swirled that Jane had sought him out with the hope that he could place a curse against her last husband who was she was embroiled in a bitter divorce with. Personal woes were on the horizon for the starlet. The rumors she drank heavily persisted, as well as relying on diet pills to keep her thin and dropping LSD. In October, the San Francisco Film Festival said she wasn't welcome. November of 1966 was not a good month for Jane. Sam Brody's wife added her name to a divorce suit she filed in the courts in February alleging her husband had committed adultery with 40 women. Was Jane the 41st? Then her son Zoltan was mauled by a supposedly tame lion at a jungle land zoo. Notice the same thing happened during the filming of The Omen. The lion had been allowed to run freely for some publicity pictures Jane was posing for. Then it was chained because the handlers noticed it was acting peculiar. The boy had been playing close to the lion when suddenly the animal bit the child in the neck and inflicted serious wounds. Two employees of the zoo pried open the lion's jaws and had to pull him off the boy. Five doctors, including two neurosurgeons, worked three hours on the boy. They said he had a skull fracture, a punctured spleen, and later contracted meningitis. Despite the alleged bitter divorce proceedings between them on June 8, 1967, Jane was spotted at El Morocco with ex-husband Matt Simber dressed with very little to conceal. Jane maintained her relationship with Anton LaVey, and in 1967, they participated in a photo op. There was debate as to whether Jane and LaVey had an intimate relationship. In a 1992 interview, LaVey's daughter claimed that Mansfield was a practicing Satanist and did indeed have an affair with her father. On June 19th, newspapers published a story that Jane Mansfield's daughter was under police protection. The story detailed that Jane Marie had walked into the West Los Angeles police station and said she'd been, quote, beaten and whipped with a leather belt by a male friend of her mother. She displayed welts and bruises on her hips and mouth. Samuel Brody said police had no right to take the child to Juvenile Hall. He used the fact that a judge had just awarded custody of Tony, her 20-month-old son, with Matt Simber, to Jane in a custody dispute where he claimed she was an unfit mother. Due to, her, due to Jane Marie's age, the judge kept details of the detention hearing secret. Jane Mansfield claimed she'd been having a disciplinary problems with her daughter. A granduncle from the Mansfield family was given temporary custody of the girl. Later was learned that Sam Brody was the one who administered the beating, and according to her daughter, Jane egged him on. June 22, 1967, Sam Brody was involved in an auto accident where he ended up with a broken leg and bruised his ribs. He was on his way to pick up Jane for a hearing about Jane Marie's custody. On June 29, around 2.30 a.m., 18 days after Anton LeVay and Jane Mansfield were last photographed together, Jane, Sam Brody, and Ronnie Harrison, their chauffeur, were killed when the Buick Electra they traveled in rammed the rear of a truck slowed by a cloud of mosquito fog across the highway. They were westbound on US-90, the waterway connection between the Gulf of Mexico and Lake Pontchartrain. Three of her children, Mariska three, Mickey eight, and Zoltan six, were asleep in the back seat. They were injured and taken to the hospital. The driver of the truck was unhurt. According to police reports, the actress was decapitated. The group left Biloxi around midnight and were 30 miles east of downtown New Orleans, traveling on a two-lane route known as the Old Spanish Trail. Later, the cause of death for the three adults was listed as crushed skulls. Within a few days, there was a dispute over Jane's body and who would handle her funeral arrangements. A judge gave Mickey Hargate and her mother custody of her remains based on his determination that Jane was never legally divorced from Hargate. 
He said their Mexican divorce was not valid. Simber, Jane's third husband, was given court approval to administer her estate. The newspapers compared Jane's fate to other starlets who didn't live happily ever after. They cited Marie the Body MacDonald, who died in 1965 from an acute drug intoxication. Linda Darnell died in a fire in 1965. Marilyn Monroe committed suicide in 1962. Carol Landis took an overdose of sleeping pills in 1948. And Carol Lombard, who died in an airplane crash in 1942. On July 3rd, Jane was laid to rest close to her father in Fairview Cemetery, located in Penn Argyle, Pennsylvania. Her paternal grandparents and great-grandparents were buried in the same cemetery. Of all her children, the only one who attended Jane's funeral was Jane Marie. The other four were under the age of 10. Brody's estranged wife was named special administrator of his $185,000 estate. It was disclosed that on May 30th, her dead husband had changed his will and named Jane Mansfield as his sole beneficiary. By this act, he disinherited his wife and two children, ages 3 and 9. The handwritten will was found in Jane Mansfield's safe deposit box. In the following days, there was a squabble to be named administrator of Jane's $800,000 estate. On July 31st, William Peak and his wife, Pigay, or Pig, and his wife were appointed Jane Marie's guardians. He was Paul J. Mansfield's uncle. It is unknown why Paul, who was Jane Marie's father, who remarried in 1957, was not given custody of his daughter. Amid the turmoil following Jane's death, those closest to her moved on and up. They each made efforts to cash in on her death. In January 1968, six months after Jane Mansfield was killed, Matt Simber applied for a marriage license to marry a 23-year-old dress designer. Her former, her former road manager, Greg Tyler, wrote a play about her life as he knew it. He was Matt's cousin. In April 1968, Mickey Hargitay married airline stewardess Ellen Ciano, 25, in a Catholic ceremony. 400 guests attended the nuptials. Within less than a year after Jane was killed, both of her husbands had gone on to remarry. Despite their claims, they still loved her when she died. Both of them were intensely involved in lawsuits for damages in connection to her death. Soon after the first year anniversary of the tragedy, Matt Simber was running a, bald car, a bar called the Puss and Boots. He was hit with a misdemeanor count of exhibiting obscene matter for showing continuous films of women writhing on a bed. A judge dismissed the charge. He also provided facilities for sketching and photographing models on the premises. December 1967, the Pink Palace went on the market for $300,000. The 28-bedroom, 11-bathroom home, with its 2.5 acres, sold in August 1968, but only for $180,000 to an unnamed buyer. Included were 264 items of furniture and wardrobe belonging to Jane Mansfield. Jane's paintings and jewelry were not included and were to be sold at a court-conducted auction. Later in the month, a jewelry firm had already made a bid of over $50,000 for the items. It was around this time rumors circulated that Jane died due to a curse placed by Anton LaVey against Sam Brody and also because of her involvement with satanic practices. Much of it was sped by LaVey himself, who claimed the accident came about due to his rituals done against Jane's attorney. Whether it was true or LaVey used it as an opportunity to grab the limelight is unknown. Shortly after her death, a memorial service was held for Jane at the Church of Satan. During the ritual, bulbs started to flare up, many attributed to the presence of Jane's spirit. Another story recounts where Jane's personal maid would overhear her son Miklos speaking to someone when he was alone in his room. He told her, I've been talking with Mommy. She comes here a lot to visit me. An unverified story concerns the 18-year-old son of a banker who was the first owner of the Pink Palace after Jane's death. He'd found a pink Honda given to Jane by the actor Nick Adams during a brief affair. Nick had been a close friend of James Dean, who found his own fiery death in a vehicle in 1955. Nick Adams died shortly after Jane in February 1968 under mysterious circumstances, which was termed accidental suicide. The teenager decided to take a spin in the car, and coming out the gate onto Sunset Boulevard, he died in an accident with an oncoming car. The family moved the same day. Then in the late 1960s, Ellen Naomi Cohen, a.k.a. Mama Cass Elliott, moved into the home. She'd given birth to her daughter Owen in April of 1967. She died from a heart attack in July 1974 in London. She was 32 years old. Another unsubstantiated story was that another owner, 
found the cache of Jane's clothing. She started to use them, dyed her hair light blonde, and started to accumulate even more Mansfield memorabilia. One night she heard what she assumed was Jane telling her to get out, get out, which she did. Another owner of the Pink Palace was Ringo Starr. His efforts at denuding the home of its pinkness didn't seem to work since the color would seep in through the white shade it was painted over with. Another story, again unsubstantiated, described where Rita Grenlin, who lived there before Engelbert, said she would smell a woman's perfume, a scent not used by anyone living in the house. In 1976, Engelbert Humperdinck bought the house for $233,500, sight unseen. According to him, it was totally uncared for. Most of the pink was gone, but the famous heart-shaped pool was still there. He brought it back to its pink splendor and spent over $1 million to restore it. He did remove the swimming pool message since too many helicopters would hover overhead to capture the well-known connection to the blonde bombshell it had been dedicated to. Engelbert made, met James Mansfield years before, so he recognized her when he saw her ghost. He said, Once I saw a figure in a long black dress in front of me, it was Jane, but it wasn't frightening. I was about to say hello, Jane, when I realized she was dead. I didn't say anything, and then she faded out. He claimed to also smell her rose petal perfume inside the home. In 1980, he had the house blessed by a priest, and she was not seen again. He put it on the market in December of 1989 for $8 million. By 1992, he dropped the price to $7.2 million, then changed his mind and took it off the market. In 1997, he offered the mansion on QVC. The price now was under $4 million. After living there for 26 years, he finally found buyers. He auctioned off the stained glass headboard, statuary, and other Mansfield artifacts. Her sons were allowed to take petrified wood, a petrified wood fireplace installed by their father, Mickey. Her daughter, Mariska, took a copper hood used over the fireplace of the pool house. Her father had engraved it with Janie, my love will flame for you forever, Mickey. Engelbert kept a statue of Christ that topped a miniature Arc de Triomphe that graced the gardens. The new owners of the Pink Palace happened to be the then owner of Alwood Estate. According to Engelbert, they said their plans were to preserve it. Instead, they raised the house to enlarge Alwood's already large lot in 2002. In 2004, Engelbert Humperdinck said in an interview, I used to smell her perfume. People are going to think I'm crazy if you write this. All houses are haunted. There are certain people who can feel the spirit. It's sad that the house was flattened. Where, where will Jane's ghost go now? Other stories that circulated but were never verified is the Pink Palace was plagued by bursting water pipes soon after Jane's death. Plumbers were scared off by moving objects and a painter working in Jane's bedroom felt that someone was watching him and once he felt a touch on his shoulder. Moaning was heard. Servants came and went after only a few days. Linda Mudrick, Jane's longtime companion, quit stating, I never want to go in that house again. The source was supposed to be Jane's uneasy spirit, worried that her children would not receive the inheritance since she died in test date. May Mann, a columnist, told of several visits from Jane's ghost while she'd work on the star's biography. The Blue Electra involved in the deadly accident was acquired by dearly departed Hollywood's death museum. The smashed and thrusted artifact had broken, had faded brown streaks on the passenger door, described as Mansfield blood. In 2021, the museum had permanently closed. Due to the nature of the incident of the accident that killed Jane, the so-called Mansfield Bar was developed. It's a bar that hangs from the rear of a tractor trailer used to catch a car's hood before it slides underneath the truck. And that is the story of Jane's Mansfield. And for those of you who are familiar with, you can tell that I'm, I'm recording this in the middle of the day because my dogs, my exotic birds, my chickens, everybody's making, they're giving me a, a background background uh, effects. Then the next story we go to is a film called The Evil. Uh, it was a scenic spot six miles north of Las Vegas, New Mexico, situated in the Gallinas Canyon. It would go through many incarnations, including being the set for the 1978 film The Evil. In 1846, the U.S. Army bought the land and built a military hospital situated close to Hot Springs. Soldiers injured in the Mexican-American War were brought there to recuperate. Less than 20 years later, it was sold and converted into the Adobe Hotel. During these years, investors eyed the scenic building beauty and soon built another hotel named the Hot Spring Hotel. It was advertised to cater to wealthier clientele, and the springs were described as curing syphilitic and kindred diseases 
scrofula, cutaneous diseases, rheumatism, etc. The going rates in 1868 were $15 per week for a room without baths and $20 per week with a bath. Billiard tables with the choicest liquors and cigars were available. Even the governor visited the springs. In 1875, it was being advertised as a resort for invalids and pleasure seekers. The Phoenix Hotel, renamed the Montezuma Hotel, promoted its 270 homes, its 270 rooms, which catered to those who were sick and those who wanted to enjoy its manicured parks, the shops, and even a zoo. It burned down in 1884 due to clogged gas lines. In 1885, they were advertising the new hotel and referring to it as the New Montezuma, built at the cost of $100,000. Its grand opening was short-lived since it burned down four months later. Through all these years, the magnificent pleasure resort failed to make an economic success and was ultimately closed. In 1903, the YMCA bought it for $1. The Southern Baptist College bought it in 1922 and less than 10 years later sold it to the Catholic Church. Its purpose was to train Mexican Jesuits so they could return to Mexico and spread the Catholic religion. During the rule of the President Calles in the late 1920s, Mexicans were imprisoned for wearing religious items and saying adios in public because it translates to with God. The punishment was hanging or firing squad. The period from 1926 to 1929 were known as the Cristero War. Priests had to register and church property was confiscated. The church went underground and close to 500 seminarians came to train at once at the Montezuma to offset the persecution of the Catholic religion. The old gymnasium was turned into the chapel. The seminarians throughout the years participated in local religious parades and received priest and training until 1972. Then for some weird reason, in 1977, the Catholic Church rented out the empty structure as a set for their horror film, The Evil. The premises surrounding the premise of the story surrounds psychiatrist C.J. Arnold and his physician wife Caroline, played by Richard Crenna and Joanna Pettit, who purchase an old manor to be used as a drug rehab clinic. The caretaker who comes on the property with trepidation is lured into the basement where he meets a grisly end. The realtor tells the Arnolds the house was built by Emilio, old man Vargas, but forgets to mention its history of weird deaths and that the local tribes called it the Valley of the Devils. Interesting thing. They should, I know it's a film, but yeah, that's the kind of thing that a realtor ought to say, but didn't. Vargas built a hotel at the spa, but the steam pools and the sulfur pits dry up and the day the hotel is, on the day the hotel is finished. This drove Vargas into seclusion. Dr. Arnold asks ex-patients and students to come and help him get the place ready. And it's all downhill from there, especially after the good doctor releases a demonic force trapped by Emilio Vargas. An online blog describes the following. There's a legend, whether it is true or not, I do not know, but I have been told it is so about the time when the monks lived in the castle. There are six rooms on the third floor that have been blocked up and never reopened. It's in these rooms that several of the monks were walled up inside of these rooms alive and were left there to suffer a certain doom of slow starvation and what have you. A total of 12 monks were walled up because they were considered a threat to the others living there. Living there, This was before schizophrenia was well known. Very bad spelling on schizophrenia here. There are also plenty of ghost stories about the castle. The movie The Evil was filmed there, and legend has it that the proprietor of the original hotel walks around that night, and that an opera singer who died here can be heard singing sometimes. There was also a local legend that you could not take a clear pick of the fireplace as the place was haunted. In 1981, the church sold it to Armand Hammer, who converted it into the United World College of the American West. The college caters to international students and is one of nine colleges under the International Board of the United World Colleges with its central offices in London. Okay, and by the way, the movie's pretty decent, but the best part of it is this guy right here, actor Victor, Bu- Victor Buono, who portrayed the demon trapped underneath the hotel. He was great. He, he did a really good job of that. All right. On to the next film. This is one of my favorite ghost stories slash films. And it's called The Changeling. And this is about the origins of The Changeling. Because there's more to it than meets the eye, besides being a good, like a cult classic ghost story. The 1980 film The Changeling, starring George C. Scott and Trash, Trish Vandeveer, is based on the paranormal events Russell Hunter, who wrote it, experienced while living in an old home near Cheeseman Park in the late 1960s. 
Russell Hunter, who died in 1996, worked as a musical arranger for CBS TV in New York City, but moved to Colorado in the mid-1960s to help his parents manage the Three Birches Lodge in Chicago. I'm sorry, the Three Birches Lodge in Boulder. In the late 1960s, Hunter began looking for an apartment in Denver where he could live and work on his music. He rented a home at 1739 East 13th Avenue, which has since been torn down, for only $200 a month. He said this was because no one else wanted to live there. Hunter claimed that beginning on February 9, 1969, he started experiencing strange phenomena in the house. First, there was the, quote, unbelievable banging and crashing that started like clockwork at 6 a.m., then would immediately stop when he placed his feet on the floor. Unseen hands would turn on faucets and doors opened and closed on their own. Paintings would fall to the floor as the walls vibrated. He told of meeting an unnamed man at a social gathering who told him the house had a third floor that could be reached through narrow concealed stairs behind the wall of a second floor closet. With the help of an architect friend, he found it as described. In the secreted garret room, he found a small trunk filled with a nine-year-old school books and a journal from a century ago. The diary's author was a disabled boy kept hidden on the third floor. He described his favorite toy was a red ball, also inside the trunk. A few nights after discovering the trunk, a red rubber ball dropped from the top of a spiral staircase in the home. Allegedly, this was witnessed by more than 300 people. Hunter conducted a seance. The spirit of the child was channeled. He was heir to a fortune through his maternal grandfather. However, he was a sickly child. When he died, his parents concealed his death and buried him in a field in what was then a remote part of southeast Denver. They adopted a child from an orphanage to take the place of the dead boy and instructed him to accept his new identity. This healthy boy grew into adulthood and became, a success, became successful and as a changeling claimed the inheritance meant for another. According to Hunter, the troubled spirit of the boy gave him directions to where his body had been concealed under a house on South Dahlia Street. He gained permission to dig. Bones and a gold medal inscribed with the child's name were buried deep in the ground. Coincidentally, the family who owned the house also owned the farmland where the human remains were found, and the gold medallion as well. The discovery did not ease the spirit, and the activity around Hunter escalated. He said, Glass doors blew up in my face and severed an artery in my wrist. The inner walls over the head of my bed violently imploded. He moved to a house on Kearney Street, but the disturbances followed him there. Realizing that perhaps the entity was more malevolent than what he originally thought, he followed his friend's advice and sought the help of a priest from Denver's Epiphany Episcopal Church to exercise the structure. The priest, who wished to remain anonymous, commented about Hunter. Quote, he did, he did seem to have a problem. We performed the last rites of exorcism in his second house on Kearney Street. End quote. Whether the rites were successful or not is unknown. However, he did not call the priest again. Soon after, the Treat Rogers mansion was demolished. Hunter said he came to see its destruction and said, quote, As the walls of the wing, which had contained my bedroom, collapsed, they suddenly flew outward and crushed to death the man operating the bulldozer. Now, that's very unusual experiences, but that the, the strange stuff going on predated even the building of the house. At the turn of the century, a childless couple lived in the home at 1739 East 13th Avenue Cheeseman Park in central Denver. The couple, Henry Treat Rogers, a prominent lawyer, and his wife, Kate Rogers, filed a permit with the city of Denver in July of 1892 to build a brick building in the Wyman's edition of Denver. Architect Henry Ten Eich Wendell designed the home. However, this land had its own peculiar history. It all started in 1858 when Mr. Biencroft came to mine with his three sons and a son-in-law named John Stoffel. They built a cabin at Vasquez Fork. The enterprising German family not only panned for gold but owned livestock. One day Mr. Biencroft and two of his sons went off to look for cattle, lost cattle. When they returned, the third brother was gone. The only other person who stayed behind was John Stoffel, and his queer behavior instantly made them suspicious. Soon neighbors came to, to help look for the missing man. He was found behind a log out in the woods shot through the head. John Stoffel was arrested and brought to Auraria, which is West Denver now. On April 8th, he appeared before temporary magistrate and admitted he murdered Thomas Biencroft, but his reasons were far from ordinary. He described where he followed his brother-in-law from Germany to the United States for the purpose of murdering him. 
what he was avenging was never known. In those days there was no cell to hold him in, nor place to try him. The people gathered for an informal deliberation, and since there was no doubt of his guilt, they decided to hang him. All that was needed was rope, a wagon, and a yoke of oxen. He was executed at a large cottonwood tree. Noisy Tom, an eccentric and well-known character, played the part of executioner. Soon the tree was cut down. John Stoffel became the first burial at Prospect Hill Cemetery, staked out by General William Larimer at the corner of Cheeseman and Congress. The informal names of the graveyard was Boneyard and Boot Hill. An undertaker named Mr. Wally took over the cemetery and by 1866 had buried 626 persons there. In 1872, the cemetery became the property of the United States due to a treaty with the Arapaho. The city of Denver then bought it for $1.25 per acre. It was renamed Denver City Cemetery. By 1890, it had fallen into disuse and it was decided to convert it to a park. Families were instructed to move the graves of their loved ones. They were offered a free plot as an incentive, but after only three years, only 700 were moved. E.P. McGovern, a local undertaker, was hired to take care of those unclaimed. For every box he delivered to Riverside Cemetery, he received a dollar ninety. He was found trying to cheat the city, and his workers were robbing the graves for any personal effects found inside the coffins. He was fired even though the work was unfinished. No one else was hired to complete the work. The cemetery was converted to Cheeseman Park, which opened in 1907, and soon whispered rumors circulated the grounds were haunted. Some estimate that as many as 4,000 bodies were left behind, but the true number has not been ascertained. However, every time irrigation work is started, bones are found. Besides the forgotten dead located just south of the cemetery, a pest house or pestilence hospital for contagious patients received thousands of souls that were left there to die. Some think that fear of contagion, especially smallpox, was another reason why so many bodies were left behind. In 2010, while completing irrigation work at Cheeseman Park, city employees unearthed four skeletons. The coroner found they were over a century old. If there was ever tombstone to commemorate them, it is long gone. Perhaps they were criminals or paupers, and they were anonymous from the beginning. They were reinterred in Mount Olivet Cemetery. Now back to the story of the Rogers family. The location of the Rogers' new home was probably built over forgotten graves, but no doubt ignorance is bliss, and the house was built as they specified. Though the couple did not have children, they did have a niece and nephew who spent time living in their home. The niece, Frances Clark Ristine, came from Illinois to live with the Rogers when she was 10 years old and stayed until her marriage to George Ristine. After living in Chicago for several years, Frances and her husband returned to Denver after the death of her uncle, and retreat Rogers in 1922. They lived in the 13th Avenue house with Kate Rogers, who formally adopted Frances as her daughter around 1927. Frances became the longtime secretary for Denver Orphans Home and the president of the Globeville Day Nursery while living in Denver. She inherited 1739 East 13th Avenue and a small fortune after the death of her aunt in 1931. She followed Mrs. Rogers to the grave after only three years. Now, a small aside here, you know, this whole story that Ru Russell wrote was supposedly loosely based on his own experience and with the spirit, but, and of course, the whole, how can I say, crux of that story was the Changeling was an orphan. And notice here, Frances Rogers Ristine ran well, she didn't run, but she was the longtime secretary, longtime secretary for Denver Orphans Home and the president of the Globeville Day Nursery. I mean, let's just speculate a little bit. If you wanted to get a, an orphan to take the place of a child that died and that you would lose some type of inheritance, that's the person to go to. So let's continue with the story. After her death, which she died in 1934, three years after her aunt, her husband, George Washington Ristine, inherited the money, the house, and he died in 1966. Francis Ristine's brother, Henry Treat Rogers II, graduated from Yale in 1914 and came to work in his uncle's law firm, Roger Ellis and Johnson, around 1916. This younger Henry Treat Rogers also lived in his uncle's house on 13th Avenue. However, he enlisted in 1917 to fight in World War I, and never returned to the house. He died in 1918 at the age of 25. A memorial fund at Yale was established in his name by his uncle, Henry T. Rogers. 
Beyond the Rogers family, many other mysteries of the house at 1739 East 13th Avenue remain. In the 1970s, Russell Hunter claimed the Phipps family, very prominent in Denver, made attempts to silence him, even to the point of putting out a hit on him, allegedly because the storyline of the book was too close to their own family history. Strangely, no copies of Russell Hunter's books are available anywhere, and I can attest to that myself personally because I tried to find one and I can't find it anywhere. What if, what if Russell Hunter, true, name, true surname Ellis, never lived in the mansion at all, according to the Denver Library, that may be the case. The research they have shows his parents did own the Three Birches Lodge in Boulder, and he may have been in Denver in the late 1960s. Unfortunately, there are no records explicitly putting him at the house. In 2015, a blogger posted the following. My family, parents with seven kids, moved into this house in 1959 when I was eight years old. It was a huge house with two separate staircases leading to the second floor, one with a halfway landing and the other with an enclosed spiral coming off the kitchen for servants. I never experienced any paranormal activities. Perhaps the ghost enjoyed the company of all the children. In a strange coincidence, Peter Medak, the director of the Changeling, became fascinated with the story because of recent deaths in his family. His older brother died, and in 1971, his wife Catherine Kermans, La Kermans Medak, 28, committed suicide by jumping from a fourth-floor apartment in Harley Street, Marylebone, London. She fell into a basement area and was pronounced dead upon her arrival at Middlesex. Her husband was away visiting his mother. In 2021, another blogger wrote... When I was 9 or 10, I used to bag Mr. Hunter's leaves. He lived down the street from my family with his black dog, Loki. His house was filled with antiques and a large piano, which he played well. I witnessed a few interesting situations at his home. The story he told me was of a little boy who was killed by a coal cart in front of the mansion. The boy's name was Eric. That was a spirit that haunted the mansion and supposedly followed Mr. Hunter to his new residence near me. Great individual, I moved in 88, never saw him again. I believe he passed in 94. So that goes again to the premise of, you know, the land, the story, how much of it is true, how much of it was made up, so on and so forth. Now, this is another story which was really interesting. And this, well, this set dates back to the 20s. It's called The Ghosts of the Lost City of DeMille. In November 2017, a sphinx head standing six feet tall and weighing over three 300 pounds was unearthed by six archaeologists it's not thousands of years old it's not even a hundred years old it was left behind in 1923 when Cecil B. DeMille filmed the silent movie The Ten Commandments on the sand dunes on the central California coastline along the central California coastline is a little known archaeology site and wildlife refuge in the farm town of Guadalupe eight miles northwest of Santa Maria the Dune Center works on excavating items unearthed from the massive set where Cecil B. DeMille filmed the silent movie The Ten Commandments in 1923. As he was finishing the film, headlines around the world heralded the discovery of King Tut's tomb in Egypt. After filming was complete, DeMille, not wanting a second-rate director to use his Dune set, he had his crew cover the entire 720-foot set in sand, covering 21 plaster sphinxes, the backdrops, and the mass of Pharaoh's Gate. He had used over 1,600 works to build his city of pharaohs. Over the years, it crumbled and was buried in the scenic coastal dunes, becoming known as the Lost City of DeMille. Director Peter Brosnan set out to find the ruins in the 1980s, though excavation didn't begin until several years later. By then, Wendy Rosian had uncovered part of it. Along with liquor bottles and tobacco tins, excavators have unearthed several sphinxes out of the 21 that were built for the set. The head of a sphinx was discovered in 2012 when the team returned to unearth the body in 2017. They found another one instead, which took eight days to remove. Brosnan's 2017 documentary, The Lost City of Cecil B. DeMille, tells the story of the project, including interviews with residents who witnessed the filming in 1923. Some have seen Cecil B. DeMille's ghost at this old set. He often stated that his first Ten Commandments film was his favorite. Some feel this is the reason why he haunts the dunes. DeMille was a flamboyant character that always wore riding boots, khaki breeches, and a broad-brimmed hat while he directed his films. Witnesses state that they have seen his figure dressed in this attire standing in front of his old set, his feet firmly planted in the sand. 
His ghost is known to motion to witnesses to move. Some speculate he felt he was directing them. His ghost... Other witnesses have stated that his ghost glared at them while they talked. It seemed he is aware of the living. He sounds like he has a big enough ego that he would come back. I mean, talk about demolishing a set because you don't want anybody else to use it. Hmm. Now, this is really interesting. This is... This is not really about one particular movie. It's about a group of people that end up dying at the age of 27. It's called the 27 Club. The 27 Club is a death list of actors, musicians, artists, and athletes who have died at the age of 27. The majority have died as a result of suicide, substance abuse, homicide, and strange accidents. Many claim the significance of the number of their age to Illuminati and occult groups. It all started with Brian Jones, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, and Jim Morrison died between 1969 and 1971. What they all shared was that they had died at the age of 27. When Kurt Cobain died in 1994, at the same age, and with the introduction of the internet and instant media, the idea of the 27 Club gained traction. There was a history of suicide in Cobain's family. Two uncles and his great uncle all killed themselves. However, it was Kurt's age that was significant. In 2011, Amy Winehouse, 27, died from alcohol poisoning, even though she had a history of bulimia and substance abuse. Her family had feared her committing suicide due to these factors. Ironically, Amy had expressed fear of becoming a part of this club. One of the last to be included in the group is Anton Yelchin, Star Trek Beyond actor who died at age 27. On June 19, 2016, he was fatally pinned by his car after it rolled down the steep driveway of his L.A. home. He was found pressed in between his brick mailbox and the security fence. Why is 27 an important number to occultists? The cube is the perfect representation of the number 27. It is sacred to Satanists and Saturnists and included in worldwide rituals that outsiders are unaware of. These ceremonies are practiced in secret at the highest level of church and state. There are 27 chapters in the Bible's New Testament. There are 27 letters in the Kabbalah. 27 channels to God and 27 names for God. Dates of seasons are important when practicing occult practices. During the spring solstice of 2016, Joan Laurier, better known as China, died from a drug overdose. Prince died on April 21st and the Queen of England, when visiting Washington, D.C., announced Prince William and not her son Charles would inherit the throne. Was another secret sacrifice to Baal offered on June 19th. A Russian-born Jewish actor would have been of special interest to the Hollywood moguls because of his first name. Anton happens to be the first of the founder of the Church of Satan, Anton LaVey. Conspiracy theorists suggest that throughout Yelchin's films, there were clues of his planned sacrifice embedded in cryptic words and images that only Hollywood elite devil worshippers understand. This is a world that operates below the surface which laughs at the stupidity of the masses. Or were they just coincidences? Anton's first starring role was in the 2001 film Hearts in Atlantis, which was released barely two weeks after the 9-11 attack on the Twin Towers. Prior to this, he had small parts and along came a spider. By the way, Hearts in Atlantis was a story authored by Stephen King. Anton plays Bobby, who as an adult remembers himself when he was 11 years old, which was 40 years in the past. The song Ain't That a Shame plays in the background. The main character is Ted Brodigan, played by Anthony Hopkins. He comes from parts unknown and hires Bobby to read the newspaper to him since he claims his eyesight is very poor. They develop a strong relationship. As the film progresses, it becomes obvious that Ted is highly psychic, apparently seeing much more than he could, even with his regular eyes. This includes a person's darkest secrets. He confronts the school bully with his knowledge, stopping him from picking on Bobby. He is also aware that Bobby's mother is self-absorbed and selfish. She feels burdened bringing up her son by herself since Bobby's father died when he was five years old. Her dark secret is that she was raped at a convention after she was duped into attending using her vanity against her. Ted warns Bobby about the low men that wear dark clothing, hats, and travel in dark cars. They are coming for him and cast long shadows. He has something they want very much. He tells Bobby that he'll know they're in town when he sees ads posted for lost dogs. Who do they represent? Men in black? spiritual men in white or henchmen for the new world order ted warns bobby they'll be coming after you too ted also recognizes that bobby has special abilities such as that he was able to beat a swindler 
at an amusement park with his mind powers. He recognizes the same power in Bobby's friend played by Mika Borum. In one scene, Ted asks Bobby, Do you know what's going on around you? The boy replies, I won't let the boogeyman get you. They laugh. References to death are unmistakable throughout the film. Eventually, Bobby, Anton, sees posters for lost dogs posted on telephone poles and he knows the low men are near and looking for Ted. He witnesses they hustle Ted into the backseat of a car and drive away with him. This takes place in a dark alley with bright neon pawn shop sign in the background. Was Bobby a pawn or are we all pawns? Bobby leaves the room. Bobby leaves the town soon after. He never sees Ted again and loses contact with his girlfriend. He returns 40 years later to find out she has died. He meets her daughter, Molly, and he gives her a photo he had of her mother, which he always carried with him. In it, she had butterfly wings. This is a well-known symbol of MK Ultra mind control disguised as an innocuous insect known for transformation. It's frequently seen on album covers, celebrity clothing, and publicity photos. In flashbacks, Bobby narrates and says, That summer was the last summer of my childhood. Ted gave me an enduring gift. He made me open my eyes and let the future in. I wouldn't have missed a minute of it, not for anything in the world. What did the film mean on deeper levels? Masonic symbols and ideals and clues to an utterly magical world of transcendence were seen everywhere. Disney would be very proud. Ted's last message to the boy in the alley as he was whisked away by the cosmic police or whatever was the hand, five fingers pressed upon the back window of a car. It's a sign to Bobby or to young actor Anton Yelchin. Insiders know it as a death sign. The film ends with Bobby getting what he wants, his Schwinn bike. He rides into the distance on a lone country road with lots of woods on either side, symbolic of the future. Are celebrities fully aware of their choices and repercussions of their decisions and make the dark choices anyway? Unspeakable and the most depraved actions are willing slaves will be required of them. This is done in order to blackmail them, as well as to corrupt those who are not willing until then. They commit murders, called blood, called sacrifices, or blood oath rituals in exchange for golden opportunities. Prior to his breakout Star Trek film, he played the lead in Charlie Bartlett. In 2002, Yelchin played a child in the TV miniseries produced by Steven Spielberg, Taken. In 2003, Anton appeared in an episode of Without a Trace. There's a common theme of lost or missing children, symbolic for those in the industry or those trafficked for elites in pedo rings. In 2004, he played Jack in the TV movie Jack and in the House of D. In 2005, he worked in the movie Fierce People. The following is a blurb for it. Finn, played by Anton Yelchin, is a teenager trying to escape his drug-addicted mother, Diane, his mother, played by Diane Ladd, by going to study tribal people. His hopes are dashed when he gets caught scoring drugs for her, and she decides to start their lives over by moving them in with her massage client, billionaire Ogden, played by Donald Sutherland. At first, Finn indulges in the luxury around him and falls for Ogden's granddaughter, played by Kristen Stewart, but he soon finds that the rich can be more savage than any group in the wild. Is this the dark side of the Hollywood industry symbolized by the Sutherland character? Once more, the character indulges himself in the luxury of the elites, like Kubrick only to be sadly disappointed in the truth behind it all. In 2006, he worked in Alpha Dog, a deeply disturbing portrayal of murder loosely based on a real case. Were these his choices for roles, or was he told to do them? The idea being that, as a rich slave, you bring in others underneath you, much like a pyramid scheme, a casting couch or gang initiation or awful hazing of forced violence and homosexual acts among young, tough shows who's in charge, and that's almost that all must do the bidding of the master. This is what happens in Hollywood and what the price of fame is. It is not mentioned out in the open publicly, but the truth is disguised in plain sight and called drama. In the film Alpha Dog, when the youths are taking the clueless boy, Anton, to his death, Anton says, My parents are going to kill me when I get back. Another disassociation with parents and everything moral and right. Were there signs of his murder purposely placed in his films? Take this 2013 film on Thomas, where there is a scene where he is almost pinned by a black jeep. In 2014, Anton starred in a film called Rudderless, similar to a film he did in 2015 titled The Driftless Area. This is the blurb for it. Quote, when a man returns to his hometown after his parents die, 
he becomes involved in a dangerous situation with a woman and a violent criminal. Anton, playing the character of Pierre, thumbs a ride on a country road from a man that, unbeknownst to him, is a criminal. Pierre carries a symbolic rosebush. They soon fight in the cabin of the truck. The criminal takes the roses and drives off. Pierre throws a rock, knocks him out, and the truck crashes off the road. Inside, he finds a bag full of money and takes it. Predictably, the criminal searches for his money. A song comes on the radio with hidden relevance. But a man can't face himself. Too much guilt to hide. I wish I could be free. This never-ending life. But the risk of losing face makes the price much too high. So I'll go on living the big lie. The big lie. Pierre falls into a deep water-filled well. He is trapped overnight, seemingly about to die. He is saved by Stella, played by Zoe de Chanel. Stella is an odd character, who lost her memory after being in a fire. She begins a weird relationship with Pierre by telling him that since she saved his life, he now owes her. Stanley Kubrick confessed to having witnessed a murder by the elites of the world. Are we viewing similar symbols in the Driftless area? In Yelchin's 15-year film career, he's always the nice guy, the victim. His characters always seem to be on the road to death. Did this mirror his real life? Later in the film, we realize Stella is strange because she's a ghost. She died in the fire. At the end, Pierre is killed in the woods, and he is led into the light by whatever Stella had become. Another film that ended with Anton's character dying. In 2015, he co-starred with Patrick Stewart in a low-budget movie titled Green Room. This was a strange choice for Stewart, who was known for theatrical Shakespeare before his role as Captain Jean-Luc Picard. In the story, Stewart owns a club and a punk band who played there witness a violent murder. They were not going to shut up about it. Inevitably, the character played by Anton and his bandmates are slated for death by Stewart and his henchmen, another role with a character marked for death. Yelchin's other co-star was Jonathan Jackson. Both Jackson and Yelchin portrayed Kyle Reese, a character in the Terminator movies, at separate times. Another word for being killed is being terminated. Did Yelchin die at the hands of a machine like the fictional Kyle Reese? Was that role another foreshadowing of how Anton would meet his strange end? Considering the title of the film, The Green Film, The Green Room, you can ask yourself the significance of it. There is none, within the context of the film that is. Green rooms are waiting rooms where the actors wait before their performance. Is this a reminder that actors work and get money at the behest of their handlers? The answers are extremely complex and rarely ever simple. They are hard to see or understand. I think there are enough clues and coincidences to be suspicious that devious things truly happen beneath the two-dimensional, innocent, fake surface of film celluloid. In 2010, Randy Quaid, an Oscar-nominated star, fled to Canada from the U.S. after claiming he was on a hit list of a group of mysterious killers known as Star Whackers. And you know what? When you look at it from that perspective of how many of his films ended up him dying, come on, you know, I've known that a lot of actors will say, oh, you know what, I, gr- I want a great part, like I do a death scene, but that's like, you know, once... I want to do it once or a couple of times the most so I can, you know, do the the death scene thing, but that's it. But when the majority of your roles, especially if you're paying a young person, end up, you're p- pushing up daisies, it's like, what? Okay, the last one, this is going to be, this is about a piece of real estate that started out quite innocuous, but in the 1930s, Oswald, Ozzie Nelson, and Harriet Nelson became famous on the radio show The Baker's Broadcast. In 1944, they launched their own radio show, The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, which later became a well-known sitcom by the same name that ran on television from 1952 to 1966. The house on the set was modeled after the real home, which would eventually develop a reputation for being haunted. The house is located on 1822 Camino Palmero Street in Los Angeles' Hollywood Hills. It was built in 1916 for a prominent Los Angeles businessman, Harold G. Farrard, on a sloping half-acre parcel in the exclusive La Colina's Heights subdivision. Architects Frank Kegley and H. Scott Garrity designed it in colonial revival style. In 1937, the bank put it up for sale at $16,500. Then-cowboy actor Dick Ferran lived in the house with his wife Madeline Piper Hollings and their two children. In 1940, as part of their divorce agreement, she gave up the claim to the house and he stayed there. She had charged him with cruelty during the divorce suit. Things didn't go good for Dick. A few months later, he was arrested, pleading guilty to the drunk charge after fighting the arresting officers. The Nelsons purchased the two-story property in 1941, 
and the exterior shots of the adventures of Ozzie and Harriet Nat show feature the actual house. The family lived there until 1975 when Ozzie died from liver cancer in the house. Harriet moved to another house they owned in Laguna Beach. She died in 1994. According to the real estate agency that handled the sale of the house three times, paranormal occurrences were reported, not only by those who have lived there, but workmen as well. The apparition of Ozzy is seen walking throughout the house. He's been seen eating ice cream in the kitchen, which was something he liked to do when living. The occupants would wake in the early morning to find the drawer containing the ice cream scooper pulled ajar. He also visits the pub room where he had a model train set that would run on its own. Renovations throughout the house have changed the layout of the house as it was during the time the Nelsons lived there. However, the exterior is much the same as when it was built over a hundred years ago. The family that occupied the house in the late 1970s complained of lights and faucets turning on and off by themselves, hearing footsteps and witnessing doors opening and closing without anyone being around. There were times when the smell of rose-scented perfume wafted through the air. A woman who lived there during this time described feeling a spirit pull back the bedsheet and something kiss her neck and breasts. A 1994 painter described seeing a white misty form near him and hearing footsteps as well. Despite the persona Ozzie Nelson cultivated for his TV characters, historians have described him as being an authoritarian figure that micromanaged his family's life, especially those of his two sons, David and Ricky. He quashed plans for them to attend college, insisting that they continue to work in show business. As a workaholic, he no doubt loved his children, but the family business came first. Rick Nelson went on to have his own musical career. He died in a plane crash on December 31, 1985, at the age of 45 on the way to a concert in Texas, at a time when he was struggling to revive his singing career. The house was featured as Ari Gold's house in an entourage. In 2014, actor Christopher Maloney purchased the home, which despite having been the abode of a wholesome family, had acquired the reputation of being very haunted. In May 2022, according to Dirt, the house was sold in an off-market deal to director Ross and Marshall Thurber for $5.9 million. It had gone on the market originally in 2020 for $6.5 million. It was removed from the open market shortly thereafter and rented out for $29,500 per month. Question is, does the house still deserve its reputation as being haunted? Does Ozzie Nelson still walk throughout the house checking out the renovations and wondering where his train set went, or has he gone on to the greatest adventure of them all? So, and one has to ask yourself, does he? And... Again, I hope you enjoyed that, all those stories about haunted movies, actors. Don't forget to sign up for my uh, my newsletter. Go to, well, it's on Substack, but if you go to Miami Ghost Chronicles, if you go to mppelcher.com, you're going to find links not only to uh, signing up for the newsletter, you are also going to get links to any of the shows as far as the video links, also podcast links to the podcast platforms, but you want to listen to any of the podcast version of any of the shows, you're going to find links there that will let you either listen from your browser or download the MP3 file without commercial interruptions. This is not only for stories of the supernatural. You can find links there for Supernatural Storytime at dot com, uh, Nightshade Diary, and also the Eerie News portion, which we talk about all the recent weird stories coming out in the media. So again, guys, thank you for coming back every week and spending this time with me. It is absolutely wonderful. I have a lot of great guests coming on, new ones, returning ones, and I hope to see you then. Take care.